Good morning, uh, PCS members and friends. Uh, good morning to you all and uh, good evening uh, to our uh, guest speaker today. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Sebastian Defner uh, from University of Maryland. And I would like to invite our scientific host, uh, Dominic, to introduce our speaker. Please, Dominic. Hi. So it is my pleasure to introduce Sebast uh, Professor Sebastian Defner. He did his PhD at the University of Augsburg under the supervision of Eric Lutz. Then he moved, um, actually, then he did a, a postdoc there, re a research fellow at the University of Augs uh, Augsburg. He moved to uh, the group of Christopher Jasinski at the University of Maryland, College Park. Um, and afterwards, uh, he became a postdoctoral fellow at the Los Alamos National Laboratory under the supervision of Wojciech Zurek. So very big names in his, uh, in his background. And finally, he managed to uh, land a professorship position at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He's an expert in many fields. Um, there are usually some parts of subfields of quantum information or condensed metaphysics, um, most well known for quantum statistical mechanics, quantum thermodynamics, condensed matter physics, um, quantum speed limits, um, bit of quantum metallurgy. And today he will talk about nonlinear speed ups in ultra, ultra cold quantum gases. So that's, uh, that's the overlap between the quantum speed limits and condensed matter, I, I believe. Um, Sebastian, the floor is yours. Well, Thanks so much for the um, very kind invitation and um, for hosting me today. Um, Dominic and I have known each other for, I don't know how many years, but it feels like forever. And when he invited me for this talk, um, I felt like I should be talking about something that we've actually collaborated on. So we've, so far we've written one paper, but we've been talking a lot about um, uh, quantum speed limits. And um, uh, the paper, it's actually not a paper yet, the project that I want to talk about today is completely fresh, completely new, um, and um, it's really the most recent thing that I've been thinking about speed limits. In particular, I will be talking about nonlinear quantum dynamics, which, as you know, might arise in ultra cold um, quantum gases or in bosons. But before we do that, I felt that it wouldn't necessarily hurt if I told you a little bit more about where I actually am. So UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County is a um, uh, research university right outside Baltimore, which is here. So here, this is Chesapeake Bay up here. You have DC, New York City is up here. And we are located right here um, at the East Coast. So strictly speaking, this is already in the south of the, um, uh, the United States. So these are the southern states, there's northern states. And we are right here um, in what um, is called the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, this also explains why um, uh, it was good evening for me. So right now it's 8 p.m. I think for most of you, except Dominic, it's um, 10 a.m. Um, UMBC, this is our campus, um, is, as I said, a, a mid-sized research university, so a total of about 15,000 students. We're right outside Baltimore. And if you're standing in Baltimore looking towards west, to, which means looking towards the Appalachian Mountains, then this is what you see. This is our campus. Um, uh, we're reasonably remote in the sense that while we're actually in the metropolitan area, um, uh, UMBC is not necessarily um, in a campus town or anything like that, because um, this university was um, built on top of um, a juvenile prison farm. And if you come in, so you can see that here, there's still the silo of the, um, uh, the old farm. Um, the physics building is um, pretty easy to recognize. It's the one with the observatory, um, so this one. And most of the time you would find me somewhere over here. Um, I'll just move this out of the way. Oh, where's my mouse? So you would um, uh, find me here. Um, this is my office. The physics department has about 25 um, faculty members. Um, uh, that means um, uh, tenure track regular professors and a couple of research faculty. And in principle, we're um, separated into four main areas, quantum optics and quantum information, condensed matter physics, atmospheric physics, and astrophysics. And as Dominic was saying, um, as a theoretical physicist, I'm a somewhat interdisciplinary, which means I'm sitting between the fields, which is why I'm officially listed, I was officially hired as a quantum optician, but um, 
um, actually listed under quantum optics and quantum information, but very quickly they also realized that someone with a background in statistical physics should actually be in condensed metaphysics. Now, more recently, I've also been um, getting interested in cosmological thermodynamics, black hole thermodynamics, and the information paradox, quantum chaos, which is why they've started listing me onto astrophysics. And there's even um, a very, very new project that I can't really talk about yet because we haven't done anything yet, but that's also going to lead into atmospheric physics. So why am I telling that, you that? This is not to show off, but rather to give you an idea that as a thermodynamicist by training, um, most of what we do is universal in the sense that we have our phenomenological thermodynamic quantum control um, approach that we then apply to many different areas of interest. Now, what I want to focus on today are quantum speed limits. And this is something that you would um, traditionally find more generally located here in the quantum information, quantum optics, quantum control um, uh, um, setup. But as you will see, uh, most of the things that I will be talking about definitely leak over into condensed matter physics. Now, the big theme um, of quantum speed limits is to better understand um, uncertainty relations. And as you know, um, now almost 100 years ago, um, Heisenberg um, uh, wrote down the uncertainty relations, which are a consequence of the indeterminacy principle. Indeterminacy principle just means that you can't actually make a prediction for um, the um, classical value of an observable until you've taken a measurement. And as you know, and this is um, what you know from Robertson, which was done only two years after Heisenberg had written it down, for um, pairs of canonical operators like momentum or position, the commutation relation, the non-vanishing commutator between um, two observables leads to these uncertainty principles, which depending on how you derive them and how sharp you make them, um, tell you that the product of the uncertainty in P and X, or A and B, is never less than H bar. Now, if you read Heisenberg's paper, original paper, which is actually beautiful to read, you find also a couple of um, strange things in the sense that um, while he, um, this is something that he shows reasonably rigorously, the uncertainty relation for um, position and momentum, he then postulates that a similar uncertainty principle should exist for energy and time. And he literally writes down a commutation relation for E and T. But now we're running into an issue with the interpretation in the sense that um, for these canonical um, uncertainty principles for position and momentum, things are usually interpreted in a way that you cannot measure um, non-commuting observables with um, the infinite precision simultaneously. Well, this is what you typically would find in introductory quantum mechanics textbooks. I can make that a little bit more precise. The issue that arises from this um, traditional um, viewpoint of uncertainty relations, then is that if you're talking about simultaneous measurements, what does it actually mean for delta t? So whatever this uncertainty relation for E and T actually is, it cannot have the same interpretation as the canonical uncertainty relations for um, uh, canonical pairs of um, observables. And this is um, uh, what I will be talking about today. So quantum speed limits are a more careful analysis, a more careful look at um, uh, these uncertainty relations there are two um, reasonably famous um, results, Mandus Tam Tam and Margot Steventon, and I will illustrate um, what this is actually about. Then in the main part of the talk, and I should emphasize this is something that is completely new, I haven't written that up. Um, so until um, last night, I only had handwritten notes, and you're the very first ones um, to ever hear about um, this project. What I've done is I've taken these quantum speed limits um, that are well understood for um, linear isolated dynamics, and looked at um, what we can say about um, non-linear dynamics, in particular for the cross PTFSK equation. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. I will introduce that later on. In particular, I will talk about the physical significance. So why should we care? And how does that arise? And I will show you that um, despite the fact that the cross PTFSK equation is a little bit more complicated, you still can find analytical solutions to the time-dependent cross PTFSK equation. This time-dependent solution, with the solution to the time-dependent nonlinear um, Schrodinger equation, and then can compute the speed limit, the quantum speed limit. And um, I will rigorously show that in nonlinear dynamics, quantum evolution can actually happen faster than in linear quantum systems. And at the very end, I will tie that into um, a paper that one of my students recently finished um, um, to illustrate how these 
questions about the dynamics and the thermodynamics of nonlinear systems fits into a larger picture of um, understanding the performance of um, thermodynamic devices with um, both Einstein condensation. So let me emphasize that again. So what I will be telling you today is completely fresh. I've never um, spoken about this before, which means things might be not as ironed as um, you usually see in talks that you've given many, many, many times before. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point and just ask for additional things. And as you see, I only brought up about 20 slides. Um, uh, so we should have plenty of time for discussion. All right, so the first more rigorous, more careful look at the uncertainty relation for energy and time goes back to a paper um, by Mandelstam and Tom, which was published in this old Russian journal, Journal of Physics, Soviet Journal of Physics in 1945. Took about 20 years from um, Heisenberg's original uh, suggestion. And what Mandelstam and Tom did was the following. They looked at the Heisenberg um, equation of motion for an arbitrary observable A. This is what you have here. Then you can, um, uh, can show and this um, follows directly basically just from a triangle inequality. So you take the average, um, use the triangle inequality, then the product of delta H, where H is um, the variance, and delta A, where delta um, A is the variance of A, is always larger or equal H bar over two, average dA dt. And this is something that really follows just from a triangle inequality. Now, this is essentially Robertson or what, um, how Robertson derived um, uh, the um, uh, uncertain relations. Now, the question is, how do you get a relationship between energy and time? Well, in order to do that, what you do is, is, is you choose the operator A to be the projector into some initial state. And then you ask, well, here we actually have an evolution. Question is, how long do you evolve? And you um, evolve the system until you reach an orthogonal state. So you start with one state and you evolve until you reach an orthogonal state. You integrate both sides, rearrange a little bit, and then within um, two lines, you find that the time it takes for an initial state psi naught to evolve to an orthogonal state is never less than pi over two, which is exactly the angle, 45 degrees, oh, sorry, 90 degrees, what am I saying? Orthogonal, uh, <laughs> you evolve for 90 degrees, h bar over the energy of um, uh, the Hamiltonian. Now, this is a very, very clean interpretation of an uncertain relation between energy and time in the sense that now we know what the time actually means. So the um, time that goes into the uncertain relation is the time that, um, so there's no delta T or anything like that, but we get um, a lower bound on the time for it takes um, for a system to evolve between initial and final state, where the um, final state is orthogonal to the initial state. Uh, okay. Professor Defner, uh, we have a question. Sure. Uh, Alexei, please go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a very naive question. So why are you guaranteed um, if you start with some initial state that you would land exactly at, or at an orthogonal state or it should be any state that has zero overlap with the original one? Um, any state that has zero overlap with the original one is orthogonal, right? Yes, <laughs> but what, I, what, what is slightly less clear to me is why um, you're guaranteed to reach exactly that state, a mixture so yeah. of that state yeah. So you're asking a control question and you ask whether the um, orthogonal state is actually reachable under the um, initial Hamiltonian. And that is not guaranteed, not at all. So in this um, yeah. uh, framework here, it's um, really a question about what is the minimal time that would be necessary to go the maximal ah. distance. Okay, is, okay. So that means that you actually can go the maximal distance. It's just a bound. Okay, okay, okay. thanks. That's a very, very good question because the way that I will be deriving the quantum speed limit later on fixes the problem by I'm um, being a little bit more careful about this issue. The other issue that arises here is if you look at the variance of the energy. So the variance of the energy is a somewhat weird um, uh, quantity that, uh, that relates initial and final states in the sense that this is a very, very unreasonable uh, measure for speed. You can create arbitrarily many um, distributions where the second moment is actually divergent. So if you had something like a, a Levy distribution, polynomial distribution, or um, Lorentzian peak, then while the mean of the, uh, of the distribution, the amount of energy in the system is um, bounded and finite, the variance can go, grow arbitrarily large or even diverge. So while this looks nice, there are many scenarios where the variance of the energy is actually not a good quantity to quantify anything. 
What happens is if the variance grows large, of course, standard deviation variance doesn't matter. If the Hamiltonian grows large, then the lower bound goes to zero. Well, that doesn't help. Recognizing this, Margulis and Leventon derived an alternative bound almost 40 years later. Um, what they did was um, they wrote down the time evolved state under um, time independent Hamiltonians. What you see here is that you can always expand that in terms of um, the energy eigenstates, instantaneous energy eigenstates, then playing with a couple of trigonometric um, inequalities, um, separating real and imaginary part. Again, three, four lines, details are not that important. You can show that the um, time that it really takes to go from initial, from an arbitrary initial to an orthogonal state is given again by the angle, pi over two, h bar over the energy above the ground state energy, you notice the energy of the ground state. Now, physically, this is a bound that is uh, much nicer to interpret because then um, uh, what we're looking at is, is that the time of, um, that it takes to evolve is exactly given by the amount of resources that a system has available, how much energy is available. And thermodynamically, you can think of that, how much work is stored in the system that you can extract to go from initial to um, a, a final state. But uh, now we have- Professor a... Diffner, uh, yeah? excuse me, yes. We have another question from oh, Dominic. Okay. Dominic should know all the answers. Well, I don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wonder, because you mentioned it's unreasonable because, because you can make distributions that have infinite variance. But couldn't you make the same argument for uh, quantum estimation theory and says the quantum fish information is equal to the variance, which can be in principle infinite. Therefore, there should be a different bound, which is not the Kramerau bound for the quantum estimation theory. Qu uh, similar to this uh, Margulis Levitin bound. Uh, I think so, yeah. There's a paper by Teth Lloyd um, where they um, uh, put these, especially the Margulis Leventon bound in, um, in relation to um, quantum metrology. So the answer is in principle, yes, but that might be a longer discussion that we should have offline because it's, um, it distracts a little bit from what I actually want to get to. So here I'm, I'm just trying to set the problem of what people have done in the past. Okay. Thanks. The bigger problem, um, uh, and to a certain degree, this is the problem that you're also alluding to, is, is that we have these two independent bonds on the same quantum evolution. You're asking about the same um, uh, metrology, about the same estimation. Now, if you have two independent bonds, well, which one is the one that we actually should observe? Which one is even larger? Is a uh, Margaret Stevenson always the better bond? Well, that can be true because sometimes we have situations where the energy distribution is sharp, so the variance is zero. But if the variance is zero, that means well, somewhere we don't even have any um, evolution at all, or um, um, uh, the mean energy becomes zero, but we have finite um, uh, variance. So how do we even think about this bond? That's a question that Leviton um, picked up and together with Toffoli in um, a highly recognized PRL, highly cited PRL, they showed that the unified bond is tight in the sense it, that you can find specific initial states. So let's say you only have a qubit and the initial state is the um, uh, even superposition of initial um, of ground state and excited state, then in that case, um, uh, the two bonds become identical and the orthogonalization time is identical um, uh, to the quantum speed limit time. Now, people got very excited about that. It's about um, uh, 10 years ago, 12, 13 years ago to be precise. Um, and um, uh, the result was generalized to many different um, scenarios actually somewhat concurrently, so even before people knew that um, the bond was tight, they started generalizing it. And you can go to arbitrary angles where I write L for the experts in the audience. Strictly speaking, these don't have to be pure states, it can be mixed states, and then the natural angle is the burst angle that goes in here. But what you also see is, is that um, while Mandel's dum tum for um, mixed states was generalized pretty easily, um, for Margaret Leventon, something goes wrong because rather than just having the angle L, which you would have expected, you get L squared over pi half. So the generalization of Margulis um, Leventon um, was a real beast and it took a while to get that right. Now, over the last um, 10 years, literally over the last 10 years, the field of quantum speed limits has totally exploded and many different generalizations have been found for. So this is all for time independent Hamiltonians, but then you can ask the question, well, what happens if you um, drive the Hamiltonian, if you have parametric Hamiltonians? And that ties into Alexei's questions earlier. So what states are even reachable? Can you create a hematonist such that you can reach the states that you're after? And what is then the minimal time to go there? And can ask similar questions if you allow for open system dynamics. 
can you exploit um, uh, um, uh, the environmental correlations to go even faster or slower? And um, together with Steve Campbell, who I believe also gave a talk in the seminar series a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, whatever, um, we wrote a topic of review now also um, four or five years ago, was started five years ago, was published four years ago, which um, has been um, cited a couple of hundred times. And again, I'm not talking about the actual number of citations to tell you that this is an important paper, but rather what I'm trying to illustrate here is this. This is a very, very active field with many open questions in the sense that since 2017, at least 300 papers have been written on quantum speed limits. Despite the fact that you might think that this is something that has been around for a better part of a century, and we should actually understand these uncertain relations, but there's still open questions um, uh, that um, allude to the fact that we don't fully understand quantum dynamics yet. So what do we have? We have this quantum speed limit for isolated driven dynamics, and at least in its original formulation, this is um, uh, what I told you today. What I've alluded to but didn't really talk about is, is that we also have seen that there are quantum speed ups in open system dynamics. I just put in one reference, um, but we first suggested that. Um, uh, but what you can probably easily convince yourself is, is, is that if you can exploit environmental um, effects, so if you have an energy influx from the environment in open system dynamics or an information influx, then you can, by um, judicious design of the quantum dynamics, find um, uh, quantum speed limits. It's quite so what quantum speed limit refers to the rate that are larger, which means to um, shorter times. Or in other words, if you uh, look at the sphere, um, if you want to evolve around the sphere, then if you do it on the surface, the path length is longer than if you take a shortcut through the sphere. Open system dynamics is uh, the shortcut through the sphere. And while all of this is nice, I was saying 300 papers um, over the last four years, what we really would like to have is a maybe technologically or maybe practically relevant statement. Question that we haven't really asked yet, but again, it ties into what Alexei asked earlier. So it's nice to know the third organization time, but if we don't even know whether the state is reachable, who cares? And then we're using some obscure trigonometric inequality that no one has seen before. And that's a good case, or in a bad case, we just use the triangle inequality or the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which are great, but they're not tight. What gives? So why do we even care about these speed limits? More importantly, while all of these speed limits are nice, the question that we really need to ask is, what are the resources that we can use to speed up dynamics? How can we accelerate? And like these environmental correlations. And what I want to talk about is, I want to show you how to do that for cold bosonic gases. And I um, want to illustrate that quantum symmetry or the um, effect of non-trivial quantum interaction arising from symmetry can be used as a good resource to speed up quantum dynamics. Now, assuming that uh, most of you are very familiar with that. I'm going to be very, very brief. So I assume that you know what bosons are Bos for two bosons. These are um, uh, um, wave functions with even exchange symmetry. And if you have many bosons, they can all occupy the same quantum state. It's introductory baby quantum mechanics. Um, Greg Stemek um, then is, if you have um, an ideal gas of bosons, um, the, um, is a critical um, density or critical temperature. Um, below above uh, the density or below which the temperature, um, all bosons condense into the zero momentum state. And this is what's called the Bose-Einstein condensation. I know that um, this is complex physics seminar, complex physics group. Um, uh, so I don't have to say much about that, but you know that the exact dynamics of um, many bosons is a very hard problem. If you want to solve that analytically, or just approximately, um, it's almost hopeless. But what you're um, probably also intimately familiar with more than I is, is that if you do that in mean field theory in Gettysburg Lando, then um, a BEC can be described as an effective 5 4 theory, not for the wave function, but for the order parameter, where the order parameter is um, uh, the macroscopic phase. And this is just all to say that um, if you do all of that and you look at the um, BEC in um, close enough to the ground state, then its dynamics is described by the gross petayevsky equation. The gross petayevsky equation is the usual time dependent Schrodinger equation plus um, uh, a nonlinear term, where this nonlinear term um, is um, proportional to kappa, where kappa is a combination of natural constants, h bar, m's, and whatever, that essentially it's um, directly proportional to the scattering length, S wave scattering length. S wave means that this is for simple bosons 
where you only have s orbitals and you don't have to worry about more complicated things. Now I could talk a lot about the interpretation of this psi. So strictly speaking, it's an order parameter, but um, it also describes the wave function um, uh, to a very, very good approximation, the many particle wave function, and you know all of this. But this is just to motivate that I'm looking at the dynamics under the cross pedayevsky equation is an important thing. The question that I would like to ask us, well, how do we do speed limits? Now, speed limits can be derived in many different ways. Um, and, and what I now want to do is, is I want to do um, a speed limit for such an equation. Obviously, I don't have an, um, a simple Hamiltonian anymore because I have to worry about the nonlinear term. And what I will be working with is a, the, um, a notion of a quantum speed limits that I've developed um, only last year in this uh, physical graphic research, in which you can show that um, the quantum speed limit is well characterized by the average of the magnitude square of psi dot, the um, time derivative of the wave function. Um, quantum speed limit that's bound on the rate, on the maximum rate with which quantum systems can evolve. Um, this can be um, translated to a quantum speed limit time. Right? Just um, integrate on both the sides from initial to final state. So let's say you start in um, initial state psi x time zero, you evolve to um, psi x at time tau. Then where tau is not necessarily a time, this is just um, some external a parameter um, that um, uh, characterizes initial and final state, um, to characterizes the path that you take, for example, in the wall sphere, if it's a qubit. And then the minimum time necessary to go from this initial to this final state is given by um, uh, this expression, where in the denominator, you have the average rate averaged over the path length tau. Now, you can easily convince yourself that this is fully equivalent to the Mandelstam time bound. And how do you see that? Well, what do you have here? psi dot squared. So this is actually just rho dot or the norm of rho dot where rho is the um, um, density operator. Um, under the Heisenberg equation of motion, you just have then um, uh, the average commutator of rho and h, which means you can um, within one line show that everything that you have down here in the denominator is nothing else but the time averaged variance of the Hamiltonian. But here's now the question. If for linear dynamics, this is just the time average variance of the Hamiltonian, where the Hamiltonian is just p squared over 2m plus v. Now, what happens with this nonlinear part? It's an additive term. It's not a multiplicative term or anything. It's just an additive term on the right-hand side. So it's not far-fetched to realize that, well, maybe there could be something like a nonlinear speed up. It somehow could explore that if you can design the scattering length, which, can, which we can make time dependent, um, such that the evolution from initial to final state, or given um, initial, given final state, under the cross pedayevsky equation, might be faster than under the Schrodinger equation. Well, intuitively, this seems to be obvious. It would be nice if you could actually quantify that. Now, if you want to quantify that, in principle, it's again a hard problem. So I decided to go to um, a system that I understand well. This is the parametric harmonic oscillator. Why do I want to do that? Um, for the usual Schrodinger equation, the parametric harmonic oscillator is analytically solvable. And I will show you over the next two or three slides how to get there. And um, the question that we then need to ask is, can we also do that for the cross pedayevsky equation? So parametric harmonic oscillator means we have a particle in a parabola where we're changing the frequency as a function of time. All right, how do we solve that analytically? There are, again, many different ways of um, how to do that paper that I'm most familiar with is because it was um, uh, something that I did in my master thesis is um, a paper by Hosimi from 53. So they, as I said, the dynamics is um, analytically solvable. And what you do is, is you make a Gaussian ansatz for the wave function, for the time dependent wave function, plug that into the Schrodinger equation. You get um, uh, three coupled differential equations for the coefficients a, b, and c, where the equation um, for a if you introduce um, uh, the xt, it reduces to the classical equation of motion. And this is the reason why people often say that the harmonic oscillator is classical, or the dynamics of the parametric harmonic oscillator is classical, because everything traces back to the force-free classical equation of motion that determines um, uh, the wave function evolution. If you solve um, this classical equation of motion, you know A. If you know A, you can solve for B. If you know A and B, you can solve for C, and you have the full solution. You can do that formally without um, specifying the protocol. 
And what you end up with is the propagator of the linear parametric um, harmonic oscillator, which looks like this. It's just a Gaussian, Gaussian evolution, as you would have expected, which is fully characterized by solutions of this classical equation of motion. Yeah, come on. Um, uh, this classical equation of motion um, with a specific boundary conditions. And if you don't change um, the angle of frequency, what you're really looking at is just um, a sine and cosine of the natural frequency omega. And again, there are many different ways of computing um, this propagator, but this Gaussian ansatz is particularly nice. Now, the question that I asked myself was, if it works so nicely for the linear problem, can we do it for the nonlinear problem? And when you start doing that, there's no guarantee, but you just have to see whether um, the same Gaussian ansatz actually works out. Well, it turns out that it does work out, so you make the same Gaussian ansatz for the nonlinear problem. You get um, three couple differential equations for the coefficients a, b, and c, where again, a is determined by the classical equation of motion, no change. b is determined by this differential equation. Again, if you know a, you know b. And the um, if a differential equation for c becomes a little bit more complicated. So you have exactly the same point as in the linear term, but then you get a correction term, which depends on the put, uh, possibly time-dependent scattering length um, kappa t and the imaginary part of c, right? So this is actually, so these are complex numbers or c is a complex number, has to be a complex number to make sure that that thing actually becomes normalizable. But this still doesn't look so bad. So we can solve that analytically. We can walk through everything. And in the end of the day, what you find is, is that the propagator for the gross pdfsky equation, GPE, gross pdfsky equation, is just the propagator for the Schrodinger equation times this thing, a time dependent phase, which is fully characterized by kappa t and x of t, where x and y, as before, are exactly the same solutions of the classical equation. Which means also for the gross pdfsky equation, um, the dynamics is fully characterized by the classical equation of motion. And the only thing that really changes this is that the propagator in space representation picks up this additional time dependent phase. Okay, cool. Analytically solved. Okay, I'll let you test that. So, what you're looking at is an analytical solution of the parametric harmonic oscillator and the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Maybe it's trivial, maybe this is something we are familiar with, but um, when I found that, I was very, very excited. Then what you can do is you can compute um, the quantum speed limit as defined before, integral, um, so the average um, magnitude squared of um, uh, the wave function, um, change of the wave function. And what you find is this, that the quantum speed limit for the cross petrovsky equation, is just the quantum speed limit for the Schrodinger equation, plus, uh, as you would have expected, kappa squared over h bar squared x squared. Well, look at these things, squares. That's a real number, that's a real number. That's a real number. So what I set out to do, namely to prove what you would expect to intuitively to be correct, namely that under the gross petrovsky equation, you can evolve faster. This actually turns out um, to be true exactly for the parametric harmonic oscillator. The quantum speed limit, which is the maximal rate with which wave functions can evolve, the maximal rate with which wave functions can change, is indeed enhanced by an additive term, which is fully characterized by the scattering length. That means the nonlinear interaction, this quantum symmetry, which um, uh, gives rise to the effective um, quantum interactions of bosons can be exploited as a resource to speed up quantum dynamics. Professor Defner, can I ask something? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you said that uh, this kappa can be time dependent and x right. is also time dependent so uh, mm -hmm. is uh, so in this equation the, for this for the uh, velocity so should there be some time average or or how what um, should no, i so put in so this is the instantaneous rate so the instantaneous rate uh -huh. the bound on the instantaneous rate you do not average but um, we can go back to the quantum speed limit time Mm -hmm. So the quantum speed limit time, the uncertainty relation, that's determined by the average uh, of um, speed limit. But what I'm looking at is the bound on the rate. Okay, okay. So this is instantaneous. Uh, yep. Rate. So for any okay. instant, um, the maximal rate for which a quantum state can change is given by um, uh, this expression. Mm -hmm. And kappa but t, it is um, always increased. Right. So this is always a positive number, no matter mm -hmm. how. 
right? It's an, okay, it's a non-negative number. This is what I should say. And the reason why kappa can be time dependent is it depends on the scattering length. And if you put the um, uh, BEC into a mnemonic trap, what happens is if you squeeze it together, then the Bose-Einstein condensate just has less space. Um, and at some point you just run into the physical dimension of the particles. So they are um, quantum particles in the sense that they can occupy the same quantum state if they're an ideal gas. But at some point you just uh, start feeling the hardcore interaction of um, the actual um, 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 atoms bumping into each other. This is scattering length. And if you squeeze it, uh, the scattering length becomes shorter. So you can make this um, time dependent. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. We have another question or comment from Dominic. Huh? Yeah, I wonder how is it a resource? Because the fact that it evolves past, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a resource, right? Just, uh, you yeah. can also say it's the, the cohering faster. Um, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Well, it seems like Sebastian Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. I was just complaining that you had frozen. <laughs> okay, right. should I repeat my question? No, I, I, so you were asking how is the resource that you can exploit? So the way that I'm, I'm formulating the quantum speed limit problem is the follow. I give you a specific initial state, specific final state. Now, if I want to go from this initial to this final state, I have two different ways of how to get there. I can either take um, uh, the linear evolution equation to go from initial to final state, which means the scattering length is effect effectively zero. So I have a very, very wide trap. Um, or um, that means very, very low density. Or um, I take the nonlinear path from initial to final state where the scattering length is non-zero. And in that case, um, uh, in the nonlinear case, I can go significantly faster, which means I'm exploiting the effective um, attraction of the bosons arising from the quantum symmetry as a resource to go from initial to final state faster. Now imagine um, what you want to do is a quantum computation. You have an initial state, you have a final state, and you want to do that in shortest um, possible time. Then you can either do that um, uh, linearly or you can do that non-linearly. And what I'm telling you is this, if you want to go faster, if you want to have fast quantum computations, you should do that non-linearly. Okay, then, then I wonder, because I, I thought this uh, quantum speed limit is the minimum time to reach any orthogonal state, but now you are talking about a specific state. So originally, yes, um, but the way that the quantum speed limit is formulated, you do get a notion of angle of distance between initial and final state. And in the original formulation, this distance is just given by pi half. So it's just 90 degrees to go from uh, initial to um, orthogonal state. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, you can measure distinguishability any way you like. And what I'm doing here is just, I'm just measuring the Euclidean distance between initial and final state. So, so now in this definition, you choose the final state that we want to reach. Exactly. Oh, interesting. And, and the, the thing with compute is the minimum byte to reach that specific state. Yep. Okay, then I can see how it is a resource. And, and it doesn't get decohered, does it? Um, so this is uh, for completely unitary dynamics. If you ah. want to include decoherence open system dynamics, that's a cool problem, but I actually don't know whether there is an uh, open system dynamics uh, extension of the cross pedyevsky equation. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen something at some point, but um, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea what decoherence is going to do to um, BECs. And is this framework uh, uh, bound to achieve this state with fidelity one? Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's very much connected to quantum control, right? Yep, yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. And All right. so this is also exactly, so if you look at my quantum speed limit, this is exactly the answer to Alexei's question earlier. Here in this case, since I'm not asking for orthogonal states, I'm asking for states that are actually reachable under the dynamics. Mm -hmm. oh, very good, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another comment mm -hmm. maybe by Alexei or okay. follow up sure. question. Uh, yeah, exactly. M more like of a comment question. Uh, I'm just curious. So now if this, if you're saying that you just need the states that are reachable, so would that have any consequences like the, um, would the, um, the speed limit be affected uh, in systems that are not ergodic? 
great question. And my student Akram is going to find out in spring. <laughs> so I literally just asked him to look into, um, well, so there are things that I can tell you about, but maybe offline, where we're looking into characterizing um, uh, the effect of chaotic behavior under this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And then if, um, eventually I also want to look into dynamic questions such as um, how is the speed limit affected by notions of ergodicity or quantum chaos, but I don't know yet. We're going to find out. Okay, soon. okay, okay, thanks. All right. So these questions actually come at the perfect point because what I anyways wanted to do is, is I wanted to quickly um, uh, do a little bit of bookkeeping of what we have achieved. So I've shown you that there's an analytical solution to the cross pedievsky equation which works exactly like in the linear case. So you make a Gaussian ansatz. The solution, the time evolution operator, the propagator is simply given by a product of the linear propagator, the propagator of the linear dynamics in a time dependent phase. From this analytical solution, I can compute what I call the nonlinear quantum speed limit. It's analytical and rigorous in the sense that um, we can show that the um, quantum speed limit under the nonlinear dynamics is always. Um, is never less than the speed limit of Schrodinger equation, which means you get a strict um, additive non-negative term. And the speed up, and this was Dominic's question, um, this is really a resource that we can exploit because it's just directly related to the scattering length that we have control over. Now, um, Alexei has raised this hand. Is there another question? Uh, yes, I'm actually curious. Um, well, the um, a question that seems to be natural to me is then, but cross pitayevsky is just a min field like approximation to a real many body quantum system. Right. So how how would this result be? Um, does this uh, result still hold for a many for a true many body quantum system or other corrections? So the speed limit that I've derived here is specifically for the cross pitayevsky equation. The question mm -hmm. that you're asking is, is um, how does the quantum, um, so how does that translate if I don't make the mean field approximation, but actually write it down for the many particle system? And what we've um, found is, and but this is this um, opens a whole can of corn because then we need to start talking about collective effects of many particle systems, and we have shown mm -hmm. rigorously that um, collective effects do lead um, uh, to exploitable um, quantum speed ups. Well, I haven't done yet. And as I was saying, so this is um, uh, really, this is fresh off the press. Until last night, there were only handwritten um, uh, notes. Um, this is a great question that I would like to explore, but obviously I haven't had time to do that. Okay, sorry, then let me ask one more like a follow-up question because um, I wonder whether, I mean, say if you take SYK model, can you establish a similar sort of um, speed limit would it be, or would it be different? Um, I'm thinking about SYK because essentially gross pitayevsky as we were saying, is a min field model uh, or approximation. So I'm thinking about other models where essentially you have all-to-all -all interaction, which in mm -hmm. principle should work in favor of speeding things up. Right. So literally last week, I asked my student Akram um, uh, to also compute the speed limit for SYK, but he hasn't started yet. So I don't know. Uh, okay, so then let me throw the final idea. So what about something like Minfield, um, like Minfield Bose Hubbard? I mean, SYK I'm expecting should be probably will be doing really well because, um, well, my naive intuition tells me that uh, because it's, um, if I remember correctly, it's the system that thermalizes the fastest. Uh, I would also expect that probably things uh, propagate there the fastest, but uh, what about other Minfield models? So. Thermalization in SYK is something that I don't fully understand yet. SYK is a fast scrambler in the sense that um, the mutual information or the rate of, of which the mutual information grows is the fastest. Um, whether this leads to actual thermalization is something that I don't fully understand yet because quantum scrambling is a growth of entanglement, quantum correlations, whereas thermalization is a growth of classical correlations. And there's something that I need to better understand. Yeah, well, I was basically hoping that at this point, uh, Dario, who's probably in the audience, our SYK expert, would correct me. Uh, okay. But anyway, yes, yeah, so I was saying. Yeah, yeah, but hmm? about, yeah, so these are all great questions. Yeah, I, I, but yeah sorry, I was just curious. Yeah, I mean, SYK is just one minfield model, but uh, there are many others which might not have any especially nice properties like SYK. So, for example, just taking. Um, 
post Hubbard model where um, we just have all to all density interaction that is also solvable. So it should be right. You can write min field equations and in principle, I, I presume then you can repeat the analysis and uh, see what you get. And I'm curious, would it be better, worse, different? Um, I'd love to know, but I have no idea. I don't even know what to expect, to be honest. Okay, okay, thank you. But great question. So um, as I was saying, so these are exactly the type of questions that I'm, I'm also asking. And in parts, um, we're on it and we will um, look into some of it. But as I was uh, saying earlier, um, there's still so many questions about these quantum speed limits unanswered that it's still somewhat uncharted territory. Um, in particular, what I'm presenting here is actually part of a larger effort um, to develop not only the dynamical understanding, but actually to understand, develop an understanding of the full nonlinear quantum thermodynamics. And my other student, Nathan, who I believe is actually in the audience, so if you have questions, you should ask him. Um, we've looked into quantum heat engines um, that operate with BECs as a working medium. And very similarly, but yet also differently, we found that you can exploit the properties of BECs in order to enhance performance of quantum heat engines. And just in a nutshell, because I didn't actually have time to talk about heat engines at all, but any heat engine um, always relies on expansion and compression strokes. Now, remember what I said about a BEC. BECs are um, uh, systems which have condensed into the zero momentum state, which means to a certain degree, um, they're superfluid. Superfluids can be compressed for free. So if you tune your cycle um, uh, just right, such that um, uh, um, you, uh, you need to th start thinking about um, uh, the atoms in the thermal cloud and not everything is um, actually going to be in the condensate. But if you design the cycle just right, such that you exploit the free compressibility, the free compressing, the inf infinite compressibility of the BEC, then you can show that um, any characteristic that you want to compute, like for example, the efficiency and maximal power is always larger. And what I'm plotting here, so in black is just the Carnot efficiency, in red you have the kirsten algon efficiency, and the end of reversible um, efficiency at maximum power is also larger. And this nicely um, fits the narrative that nonlinear systems have additional resources, has additional um, properties that if um, controlled correctly, appropriately, can be exploited to outperform the linear counterparts. This brings me to the end of my talk. This is um, all I wanted to tell you today. So if you forget everything that I've said, I hope that you will at least vaguely remember that we spoke about the kruspet equation and that I showed you how to solve that analytically for an unparametric harmonic oscillator. I showed you that um, these nonlinearities arising from quantum symmetry um, can be exploited as resources um, to speed up dynamics. And uh, that this also ties into um, uh, the the bigger narrative that um, any form of quantum symmetry can be exploited to boost thermodynamic or just simply dynamic performance. So that's the team. That's Akram, the student that I was talking about. This is Nathan, um, who looked into the heat engines. And if you think um, uh, this is all cool and great and you want to come work with us, um, so there's still time to apply for graduate school. Deadline is January 1st. You need these um, standard documents. And um, we have two graduate programs. If you want to work with me, you need to apply for physics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Defner, for this uh, excellent and exciting uh, seminar. Uh, let us thank our speaker. Do you have to pretend applause? <laughs> so in two years of giving um, uh, virtual seminars, I've never had um, pre can applause. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Actually, uh, this is uh, Juzar's uh, kind of uh, finding. So, so uh, his legacy. So he was uh, heading the seminars last year and uh, he passed on this. Uh, uh, but okay, on, on a more <laughs> serious note. So uh, we are open for... Uh, questions. Uh, Dominic, please go ahead. Yeah, so I wonder, uh, did you introduce this Gross-Pitaevsky Gross equation as a mean field solution to some other model? So when you talk about these quantum speedups, you are actually talking about approximations, which you then can then solve and, you know, it, it 
doesn't lose anything, but still it's it's a, an approximate model, right? So one has to ask the question whether it really solves the um, the true model. Uh, well, so you... the question that you're asking is, um, it's maybe not necessarily a fair question. Okay. So everything that we ever do in physics or in theoretical physics is approximate nature. The question that we do need to ask us is whether the equations of motion that we're writing down describe experimental um, realities to very high accuracy. Mm -hmm. And the cross pedievsky equation does um, predict um, experimentally observed behavior to very, very high accuracy. So it doesn't really matter all that much what the underlying microscopic model is, at least as long as phenomenologically, um, the evolution equation that I'm looking at does explain experimental reality. And, and so far, I'm happy. If you don't like um, uh, the cross pedievsky equation as a description of the BEC, that's fair. It certainly has its issues. It's, um, so it only describes um, the um, uh, BEC in its ground state or very close to the ground state. Um, and you want to start thinking about um, uh, the excited atoms and thermal cloud around the BEC, you can do that. Things become just uh, more complicated, but as I said before, then in that case, you run into um, a many body quantum um, description where we have already shown that collective um, effects um, can be exploited for quantum speed ups. If you don't like the co um, code um, uh, gases angle at all, nonlinear um, evolution equations also appear in nonlinear optics. And then nonlinear optics, it's not even a, a mean field approximation anymore. It just describes um, uh, the properties of the crystal. So if you have a nonlinear fiber cable, that's just described. So the paraxial equations are just become exactly the cross pedigevsky equation. Mm, that's an excellent answer because you basically pointed out that I'm doing the same mistakes in my other papers. So, <laughs> uh, bad point. Thanks. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, Jan, uh, Jan has a question, please go ahead. Yes, <clears throat> hi, so thanks for the talk. And um, you're mentioning uh, using like nonlinear um, resources to speed up the, let's say the computation. And you have chosen the, the BEC as, as an example. Do you expect also this to be true for say a generic uh, soliton, let's say in, um, yeah, in many body systems or mean field description of solitons? So the statement that I made today that, um, okay, maybe I illustrate that by looking at the equation. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the cross pedievsky equation, so this is the speed limit. Um, speed limit is, uh, you can derive that independent on uh, the evolution equation. This just um, uh, follows from estimating the rate of change. Now, whenever you have a correction to the linear evolution equation, either through a mean field approximation or through some collective effects, this additive term um, will lead to a resource that you can speed up. It might not always be as clean as for uh, this particular example, where you get the um, separation of um, the linear speed limit plus some additive term that is always non negative. Mm -hmm. But essentially, from you can see that by essentially just um, considering things like triangle inequalities, you will always get an additional term okay. that you can expect. So, this is like a lambda phi 4 term, right? Uh, yep, yeah, that's exactly what, okay. um, the origin of the term. I see. And the kappa has to be of like an attractive nature. Um, if I remember correctly, you even can tune that to be. So what I'm thinking is if you have Tonks Gerardo um, or something like that, I think you can tune also in a repulsive regime. So this is a BEC, so in the BEC you would expect this to be attractive, but depending on, on the underlying potential of what you do, you can probably also create some form of hardcore bosonic um, interaction where you get effectively um, fermionic behavior. Okay, so you could do this also with fermions. Okay. I would expect so. I see. Okay, thanks. Oh, effective fermions. Hmm. Or anions. Nathan is in the audience. If you want to hear more about anionic statistics and what to do with them, he's the expert. Thanks. 
Dominic has another question or comment. We have another question. So, so you wonder since you can choose that state uh, in the quantum speed limit, can you choose any state? Does it mean that whatever you state you choose, there is some time that it takes to evolve into it? Um, uh, yeah. So since you're allowing Q for time-dependent potentials, yeah. Oh, so you uh, you assume you can design your potentials in this. Yep. Oh, I see. So this is really married to this quantum controller. Right? So this yep. really, uh... Yeah. So this is really formulated. Um, now my computer is frozen. Ah, here we go. Oh, well, we... So this is really designed for time-dependent Hamiltonians, of, um, rather for time-dependent um, potentials, and where we even have the uh, um, additional control knob of um, uh, the time-dependent strict scattering length. And mm -hmm. you could solve a similar problem through optimal control theory, mm -hmm. which um, actually this is something that I um, uh, might like. Um, there's a paper that my new student Max is writing up right now. Um, uh, looking into um, formulating speed limits within a complete control theoretic framework. So what you do is as you um, write down the, um, you solve the, um, uh, the optimal control theoretic description of the problem, and it, meaning that you um, determine the initial and the final state, and you ask for the optimal Hamiltonian to go from initial to final state in minimal time. Mm -hmm. And to, and obviously this minimal time is related to a quantum speed limit, so you can derive an optimal control theoretic version of the um, uh, quantum speed limit. Um, and you could do something similar here for the nonlinear dynamics, but that's something that we haven't done yet. We only have done for um, linear gate operations. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, you're right. So, so this is something that can be phrased entirely in terms of optimal control theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alexei has a question or comment. Complaint. Or complaint. <laughs> no, not yet at least. Uh, not yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> I have to think about it. Now, um, I have a question that is a, a bit of a follow-up to the uh, many body systems. So um, mm -hmm. uh, yet another example that um, came to my mind is, um, I think, um, what about um, unitary circuits, uh, which uh, seem, I mean, if not exactly solvable, at least um, they're quite, they can be simulated pretty efficiently. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is about, what is known about the speed limits in these systems? Um, I don't know. So what is not in general? I don't know. Me personally, I know close to nothing. Okay. And perhaps even more interestingly, you can also make the nonlinear version of this um, circuits, which um, maybe or might be also worth um, looking at. Well, that's just a wild guess. Yeah, I guess so. But so I, I really like the um, type of questions that you're asking um, because it illustrates again the point that I was trying to make earlier. So for 100 years, we've been looking at these speed limits, but um, all these practically or um, technologically relevant scenarios are completely unexplored and we don't really know yet what to do. And unitary circuits, nonlinear um, circuits, and what I mentioned earlier, nonlinear optics, um, formally, uh, for example, for communication, state transfer, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of questions that have not been addressed yet. Yeah, but perhaps in a, I mean another one, but this is even a wilder guess. I'm I'm just curious. I mean, so here, um, well, let me perhaps even ask it here. So in principle, the scattering, uh, the coupling constant, k can be made time dependent. Right. So uh, what would be the optimal k of t to maximize? Uh, the overall speed limit. I think for the um, for the Grosby-Tayevsky example you've shown here, um, the expression for the speed limit is relatively simple, so you can immediately answer that. Uh, I believe, yeah. So you just need to increase the coupling constant. It seems. Yeah, well, is that correct? So you, for a couple, you probably get a bang bang type um, protocol, right? 
Um, no, I'm just asking, I mean, if I want to maximize to or to increase the speed limit. So for this uh, gross speed skip problem, it seems that the bigger the coupling, uh, I know, not quite, because you divide by x. By the way, remind me, what is x of t here? So x of t is a solution of the classical equation of motion with um, uh -huh. specific boundary conditions. So this is um, okay. like a sine function, a little bit more complicated than the sine function. Okay, so yeah, so so if now if, if I ask a question, if I want to maximize the speed limit uh, for the, this um, gross Pitayevsky problem, right. is it just enough to increase um, the coupling k of t, or would it be in some oh. way compensated? Um, so there definitely so there's definitely an interplay between uh, the frequency and the coupling coefficient, and I mm -hmm. think while at least theoretically you would like to treat kappa and omega as independent control knobs. Um, realistically or physically, this is probably not correct. Because the way that you change the scattering length is by changing the effective volume that the BEC has available, right? And the effective volume is given by um, uh, the angle of frequency or one over the angle of frequency. So you would expect um, there to be a function of dependence of um, kappa and omega. But what exactly okay. is it? So <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, but that basically brings me to the question that I had in mind originally. Um, whether there's any intuition, uh, I mean, if you have a multi-parametric, uh, say, non-linear model, what, what, um, where should you um, push your system to maximize the speed limit? So in everything that we've done in the past, we only had um, uh, single parameter families. So we never had two control arm mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to know, and um, this is something that I really would like to do next year. So as soon as my student okay. Max is done with the paper that he's writing right now, these are the type of questions that you um, should look at. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, perhaps something else for the next year. Um, so, what what is the experimental status? So, you, uh, you were you mentioned both BEC and the the heat engine. So, uh, is uh, are you in contact with some experimental groups? Uh, are you aware of of what is uh, the status? So, I have um, uh, close friends and collaborators at the University of Sao Paulo in Sao Carlos. Um, I don't know if you know Sergio Muniz, um, who was apparently the first person to create a BEC south of the equator. Um, mm -hmm. And as soon as the situation in Brazil ever gets better funding-wise, we're going to build the engine. Mm -hmm. But well, political realities somewhat get in the way of science. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, especially with the engine, so uh, the there is a trade-off, right? So uh, it would be maybe economically also. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I yeah, you would hope so, but I mean, he must have heard the um, news that um, Brazil cut what eighty percent of the federal funding budget, and um, that makes things very very hard. Mm -hmm. And we were on track. We have uh, another paper in the works, um, beautiful paper of Dominic Kerr to talk about it you know, almost two years ago. And uh, the project is not concluded because right now simply um, because of lack of funding to um, do the last experimental test. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Alexei, do you have uh, further questions? No, I think I'm a, a little over my hand. Uh -huh. Okay, so in this case, uh, if there is no further questions from the audience, uh, let us thank uh, Professor Defner again. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, we conclude uh, our today's uh, seminar.